When we started looking at this, we didn't initially have the vision that this really changed the world. We started out trying to solve a problem and realized the solution would change the way that we live and work. This is the Techsploder Podcast, Episode 2, for Friday, May 10th, 2024. Eddie Barker and the creation of DSL. This episode of the Techsploder Podcast could not happen without the financial support of our wonderful patrons at patreon.com slash Jason Howell. If you like what you hear, head on over and support us directly, and thank you for making independent podcasting possible. Hello and welcome to the Techsploder podcast. I'm Jason Howell. It is so good to be back. It is so good to uh, to hear from folks who watched or listened to last week's episode with Tom Merritt. Man, I'm so happy that it was received so well. People uh, really connected with the conversation. And that's really what I'm looking for here. This The Techsploder podcast is really meant to be a, uh, a, a chat, like a casual conversation with people who live and breathe technology. It's also an opportunity for all of us to find some common ground about what we find makes you know technology so magnetic to us. And in the case of today's guest, what that magnetism to technology can actually lead us to create and to innovate. We've got an amazing guest coming up, but I'm going to get to that in a moment. Before we get into the show, a few bits of housekeeping. First of all, like I said, this is, of course, episode two, which means we're very early into the Techsploder podcast experiment. So at this stage, especially, your help goes a long way to make sure people discover the podcast and then hopefully they subscribe to it. So please, if you are enjoying the podcast so far, give us a review on Apple Podcasts, share it out to your friends um, or review it really anywhere. It doesn't have to just be Apple Podcasts. If you if there's a review mechanism wherever you happen to get the podcast, drop us a review. It really does help us out. And if you want to support us directly, you certainly can. Patreon.com slash Jason Howell. Uh, that actually supports the production of this show. It also gets your name read at the top like John Garrison, who has been incredibly supportive in my transition into independent content creation. So thank you, John, and thank you to everyone who contributes at patreon.com slash Jason Howell. Okay, let's get into it. Today's guest is not likely to be someone you've been listening to in the podcast world or you know, even reading you know, their news reports on the tech news sites. Now, this is a little bit different today's episode. Sometimes I have the opportunity to take a look into the past and talk with people who literally shaped the technology that many of us probably take for granted today. And I'm certain that there are tech fans who have wondered how we got to this moment in time when high speed internet is incredibly abundant and very speedy, actually, <laughs> as well. In order to get here, you know, I, I don't know if you had this experience. I certainly did. We had to muck our way through the dial-up years. And on the other side of that muck was a little technology you may have had some, some 30 years ago called DSL, or Digital Subscriber Line. Now, it really took the paradigm that people were used to, that paradigm being the use of the phone line for transferring data from one network to another, be it BBSs or the internet, whatever, and it added speed and flexibility to it. Now, I was a child who had his parents often picking up the phone <laughs> while I was downloading a game from a BBS, a bulletin board system with my Commodore 64, using a dial-up modem. Um, and so DSL technology actually also prevented that. It prevented anyone from having to hear those dial-up tones screeching in their ears anymore. Well, that is obviously until now, because there you go. I don't There's something that's pretty nostalgic about those noises um, now uh, with some distance. Anyway, today I am thrilled to have the opportunity to talk with someone who was critical to the development of broadband technology back in the mid-90s. Eddie Barker, AT&T's AVP of Mobility and Access Architecture, is here with me to chat all about his involvement in the development of DSL technology and so much more. Eddie, it is a pleasure having you here today. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for having me and for having me on Techsploder. 
So let's talk a little bit about uh, technology history. Um, I know I have my own personal memories of DSL back when I was younger. Let's start a little bit before that. Tell me a little bit about how you started your time with AT&T. Was it actually developing DSL? Like, was that your first project um, or was there something prior? How did that all start? So, you know, really, I started as a child just mystified by communications, Jason. So telephone and radio and television. And I just wanted to know how did these things work? And, you know, I'd kind of done some building crystal radios when I was young and audio filters in my teens. So I went to college and majored in electrical engineering and specifically the portion of that was, which was analog and digital communications. But while I was in college, I also started uh, to work with ARPANET. And that's what ultimately, you know, became commercialized as the internet, you know, using TCP IP. So at that time though, it was entirely text-based. So it wasn't glamorous, you know, like we see today with all the graphics and videos and things like that. So, um, you know, I was working naturally, you know, I was interested at that time in working for a telephone company. Uh, and, you know, due to the rich history of AT&T and its innovations, um, and I'll mention a couple of those, like Claude Shannon developed, you know, digital information theory and Doug Ring developed the concept of cellular communications and, you know, William Shockley invented the transistor and all those things were invented, interestingly, in 1947 in sort of the post-World War II technology renaissance. So um, a lot of rich history there. So I started with Southwestern Bell in 91. And, but little did I know at, at the time of the massive changes that were about to happen. And that was based on many different technology developments that were just about ready to collide as this came together. So those uh, developments were things like inexpensive personal computers in people's homes for the first time. Windows 3.1 was developed. And you look at Netscape, that was sort of this awesome browser of its day that made graphics appear on your screen and not text. And ultimately digital subscriber line, which you know allowed us to have a better than dial up experience. And then all the applications that really took advantage of those new ways to communicate and change people's lives. Yeah, you know, it really was a moment of innovation in all of these different directions. And, you know, when that happens, it's exciting, but it's also very complicated to kind of organize around that. Can you know, can the technology keep up from the perspective of the networks that are supporting it? And like you said, you know, graphical internet coming on board had a higher demand for bandwidth. So many things happening all at once. And I actually really recall how slow <laughs> dial-up could be. Uh, then the internet came along with Netscape and that, that graphical interface and, and experience. And that all needs a better infrastructure to support it. So, you know, I know as a user that I experienced pain points, but I'm sure AT&T being on the other side of that equation, you know, experienced its own pain points as well. It's, it, it, you know, it's AT&T's phone system being used for all this data. Talk a little bit about the challenges from AT&T's perspective with dial-up that really, I, I'm sure, led to the development of DSL. And you really nailed that because, you know, when we started looking at this, we didn't initially have the vision that this really changed the world. We started out trying to solve a problem and realized the solution would change the way that we live and work. So our initial challenge was really associated with the long durations that people would connect to the internet over dial-up modems. And, you know, our problems were that, that our voice switches that were designed for connecting people's phone conversations for short conversations, you know, with, the busy times of the year being, you know, Mother's Day and, and things like that. So we had a problem that, you know, we were having people connect and staying connected for days and nights. And we, we had to make some, some decisions on how to deal with that. So DSL came about 
And, you know, we worked on commercializing it and standardizing it. And so what, what digital subscriber line allowed us to do was to nail up an always on internet connection. So you didn't have to connect and wait for long periods of times. And that internet connection worked on the same phone line at the time that was already, you know, mass deployed for, for many, many years. And then it worked at frequencies over top of your voice conversation. So on the same line now, you could have always on internet and then you could, you could pick it up and have dial tone as well. So, you know, we did field trials with large corporations um, back in the mid uh, 90s. And they were those trials were looking at this high speed Internet access and our first virtual private network technology for work at home using, you know, client secure clients that we could put on Windows at the time. And really, the rest is history on sort of how that evolved. Where did the idea of using like the existing telephone lines for that separate stream of data come from? I mean, granted, at that point, we were using our existing lines for dial up. So that was kind of a paradigm that we, I suppose, were kind of already enjoying. Was there ever a talk of building out a separate, like a separate connected network? And I mean, you know, when I think about that, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a pretty gargantuan task, uh, especially at that, that time in history. But um, where did that idea come from? Well, you know, that's interesting because, you know, if you look at the, the cost to build a utility, you know, most of the cost isn't, you know, the networks connecting the United States and internationally. Most of your investments that last mile to connect to the customers' homes and businesses. And, you know, interestingly... So, so you're incented economically to try to use what you have if it will meet your needs and requirements. So, you know, about the same time that we were exploring DSL, we were also um, testing some of the first fiber to the prim technology that was available at that time. It was very, very early, but um, you know, we looked at it, and you know, that would that would be a huge investment. Um, to replace all the copper that we had, uh, you know, in to, connected to all our customer base. And these are millions and millions of, of customer connections. So, you know, we put that on the back burner, still wanting to look at that in the future as really the next revolution that we had to go through. But the fact that this breakthrough in technology that, you know, the uh, gentleman, John uh, Kioffi, that his team kind of first developed some of the capability to make DSO work through uh, a new modulation capability. He was AT&T in prior years. And so this technology was maturing. And ultimately, I think when we finally commercialized that and made the investment decision, we were going to cover about 70 million lines using that existing copper in the ground to get this technology out between like 99 and 2002. So the fact it was already built allowed us to really go quickly and to roll that out amazingly fast. Yeah. And when faced with that versus the idea of building out separate new infrastructure, it's, it kind of seems like it's a, it's a no brainer at that point. Did it take long to validate the concept? Did you f face any, any sort of resistance <laughs> along the way to, you know, to the idea of this working and being, uh, I guess, accepted and adopted at a wide scale? Was, or was AT&T just eager to kind of get this out as fast as possible, knowing that people on the other end were going to, uh, to understand w what the value of that is and uh, be able to enjoy it? You know, I, you know, we did have challenges at first just on scaling the technology like anything, right? The first things we got were on breadboards with soldered connections, and we had to make them work. And we did field trials with it, and it worked great. But obviously, what we had to, were able to deploy then was just there were a lot of different proprietary implementations that didn't work with one another with different suppliers, different chipsets. So, you know, we standardized it in ANSI and ITU, you know, for a global standard, and that helps drive down the cost. And then, 
we, you know, had several companies that we work with to really scale it. And at the time, we actually partnered it with ATM. Asynchronous transfer mode is sort of the switching and transport side of it. And we mass deployed it. And I, you know, when we did trials, we knew this was going to be popular. We knew it solved our problem. But as we said, you know, about that time, you know, you now had eBay, you had Amazon, you had all of these new technologies that were cropping up. And, you know, ultimately, you know, when you have something that sort of sells itself, so you have word of mouth marketing, it's a great product project to work on. Right. And, you know, and, and even if you look at today and we've, we've evolved a lot back then, people, when they moved, even wanted to make sure they could get these things where they were moving to. Right. Because it allowed them to have so much more flexibility in their lives. Yeah. It's interesting when you were listing kind of some of the companies and the technologies that were, you know, would immediately benefit from this eBay, you know, some of those other companies of the time. The the name that appeared in my head at, at, near the top of the list, possibly because I was the age that I was when it happened, was Napster. And this this whole, you know, element of the Internet that suddenly, you know, this trading of media and and I guess peer to peer sharing peer to peer file share, sharing it just in general like it couldn't have happened nearly at the scale at, at, that it did if we were locked to 56k uh, dial up internet you know for better or for worse I guess it depends on the side you know side of that perspective that you sit but that's interesting yeah and even you know if you look back you know now, Look at Microsoft when they would do a new OS download. Think how long that that would take over, or if it would even be possible over dial-up. So it just changed everything, and I think the velocity of technology adoption for the industry. So it was an exciting, you know, time, and we've certainly now evolved, you know, beyond that. I don't think we, you know, we had that revolution, and then a lot of, you know, evolution. And, you know, and then obviously we, we added internet connectivity to smartphone adoption, you know, and that started happening. So we've, you know, certainly continued to, to evolve at least until the next revolution. Well, yeah. And you've, you've kind of hinted a little bit at that as well. Um, All of that work, you know, really led to an ecosystem where speeds are just crazy fast and and capable by comparison, right? So specifically, you work closely with AT and T's fiber deployment now. Maybe talk about some of the common challenges. You know, it's something that keeps coming up with uh, up for me in the last you know a handful of months as I think about technology is the more things change, the more things stay the same, right? And the the technology here with fiber no doubt it's it's so far and away it more advanced than what we were seeing with DSL or, or dial up or you know those other technologies that led to it but i'm sure there are some some similar challenges that you face uh, between these technologies some 30 years later what what might those be that's you know that's a great question because when i look at dsl other than just the challenges to get it deployed and the economics and the technology one of the you know little issues that I recall very clearly is when we first started deploying it and going into customers' homes, what we would literally do at the time is we would, first of all, have to put in an Ethernet card. They didn't have them at the time. If you think about that sort of standard today, right? So we would put in an Ethernet card. It was probably 10 megabits per second, maybe 100 later on megabits per second. And then one of the things that we would test, you know, when we were there was we would do some speed downloads. And a lot of times, at least in the early years, the bottleneck was their PC. The hard drives did not have a fast enough read and write to download video and images. So, you know, carry that forward to today. And as we've gotten into faster and faster broadband and specifically, um, you know, fiber to the prem, you're, you know, we're going to continue to hit those bottleneck points, whether it's all of the, you know, huge pace of, of um, Wi-Fi development in terms of as we go from, you know, Wi-Fi 5, 6, 6, you know, A, and now we're at Wi-Fi 7 with these faster channels. The Wi-Fi, if you're not too far off or going through too many obstacles, 
It's as fast as the Ethernet connectivity. But we're also now going from one gig. You know, we've gotten to a gigabit using Cat5 cabling, right? And now as we go higher than that, we're getting into newer types of Ethernet, right? In addition to Wi-Fi. And that's driving new types of cabling. And that can be confusing for customers, right? Well, what is Cat6? What is Cat6A? What is Cat7? What do I have, you know, that I'm wiring with? And so I think as we go through these points of time, it, you know, we kind of go through these stair steps of how technology affects people and what's in place at the time, not just in our plant, but even in, in customers' homes. So we have to look at that really carefully and to see if it's ready and to see what the adoption is and what the application but. You know, I think anytime we do this, though, it just opens up a world of new content creativity that allows them, you know, to, uh, to you know, be creative, essentially, and create new businesses. Yeah, and especially at a time right now where, you know, maybe maybe the buzzword has, has uh, cooled a little bit, but the metaverse, this idea of these virtual worlds and, you know, um, you know, obviously artificial intelligence is huge right now. I kind of see those technologies at some point converging to to a degree to where these kinds of experiences become much more desired and much more pursued by people on the other end, which does require fatter pipes, you know, the ability to transfer all of this data uh, in order to support that. And kind of along those lines, where, you know, if you if you had to use your crystal ball and look forward in the next 10 years, obviously not revealing anything that you can't reveal <laughs> because you still work with AT&T, but like from a broad spectrum, like what do you see all of these technologies enabling and uh, what are you excited about for the like the next 10 years from this from this pr uh, perspective? So, you know, when I step back and I, and I fortunately I'm in a position where I get to work on a lot of new things. Right. And I in a lot of that, I get to work on things that may not even see adoption or development for years out. And these are things like we do at the international standards bodies where we work with engineers of all from all over the world and everybody brings in their ideas. And we want to, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we want to all adopt something similar so that we can get economies of scale, right? And make make what we deploy inexpensive where we can get it to all walks of life and, you know, and geographies and income levels. That that's really the goal. But when I look at technology, I'll say, you know, speeds are important. And, you know, today we've we've we've, you know, just had a huge growth in the speeds we offer. But really more critical than speed is always being connected latency you know optimizing that for all the applications that we need to use and capacity is the big one because speed's important but really what's most critical is to make sure that during those busy pop times of the day you know the mother's day that we talked about in the old voice network well now we have to do that for the last mile connections into our network, the internet, the cloud environments that, that we host all of our applications on, that has to be able to scale. So when we look at new technologies, whether they're for just consumers at home or whether they're for businesses, we have to make sure that we've got the capacity to give them a very good user experience. So really those three attributes enable you know, future technology development across many areas. So entertainment and medical uh, finance, education, um, employment. So, you know, we're, today we're seeing a massive investment really in five from, from a, a, you know, public and private uh, investment. Um, and in even our own companies, you know, we're building 30 million living units, um, which is a, a big part of our footprint. Um, you know, we're going to have that done by 2025 or on schedule. But if we look at the future services that these new technologies will support with all this additional bandwidth, um, you know, I would say the, the types of things that are going to be driving that bandwidth are really, you know, things like personal, personalized virtual worlds. You mentioned the metaverse, real-time gaming, 
you know, which is different than what we have today. Holographic imaging is going to take a tremendous amount of bandwidth and some of that really medical based. Um, one of my favorites is really connected wearables and enhanced reality. And that could even you know, include implants. So imagine that, you know, you walk into a room with, you know, you're maybe something a little more stylish than uh, the goggles that we have today. But you could look around and you might see somebody that you met a few times. You should know their name, but you forgot it. But what if you had the ability through your glasses, they would kind of help you. They would give you that advantage to it's got people's names. It does facial recognition on it, right? What if you're giving a speech and you've got your glasses? Um, you could have your speaker notes, you know, where you didn't have to have like a separate, you know, podium uh, pushing those the, the, the notes out. Um, a super connected home. And one of my favorites, and I think it's really, it's close, is personal robotic control. It's going to have AI, but think about a real life digital twin. Think about now you have to, you've got some thing, kind of like a someone that you need to keep busy while we're, you're working during the day. And you need to sort of keep tabs and make sure they're functional. They're doing things correctly. That's connectivity. And, you know, it goes back to the things that I grew up with, you know, that were just dreams between Star Trek and the Jetsons and lost in space. Right. And these are the things that we're seeing realized today. And I think, you know, as, as they as they continue forward, um, you know, they're, they're going to keep driving new applications. So optical fiber and wireless communications and that cellular and Wi-Fi and now satellite to fill in the spaces that you don't have connectivity are the current technology enablers. And I think these will be the things we use for the next 30 years. What happens after that, I think will be another technology revolution. And I think that's where we'll see quantum communications, which further add capacity and latency improvement over distance. And that'll improve the lives of humankind tremendously at that time. And, um, you know, and I, I wish my crystal ball was a little clearer than that. But I, I think there's some amazing, you know, things on the horizon that uh, we, we haven't dreamt of yet. I think you're absolutely spot on. I love I love thinking into the future to kind of see how these things, you know, make make past desires or, you know, things of science fiction become a reality. And actually, you kind of alluded a little bit to this, if, I, if you don't mind to kind of round this out in the spirit of Texploder, which Texploder really is about kind of the human element within this soup of technology that we all live within. We're so surrounded by technology and bits and everything like that. But there's also the human perspective and the human element and experience within that. I'd love to ask you a question that's along that line, which is, you know, probably a little different than some of the questions you've been getting uh, <laughs> as you've talked about this stuff in the past. But um, you've alluded a little bit to being younger and some of the influences that you had when you were younger that really um, that you were exposed to that I imagine kind of set the pace and laid the foundation for your, your career in technology. Can you reflect a little bit on like a piece of technology that you could look at and say, that really shaped my love for what I do now at a, at a younger age? And what was so different about it? What was so magical about that? You know, to, to me, the technology that influenced, you know, me was probably more than anything was, was television. And, um, you know, I started life, we had a few channels, right. And, you know, I remember growing up and we were so extremely excited when, you know, when we could get cable, right. And I'll never forget when MTV and HBO, you know, came out and, and, um, you know, that was, that was a, you know, a, a changing, you know, point in life when you could get, you know, we could probably get 20 or 30 channels right at that point in time. But for me, it was kind of like, well, you know, as I mentioned earlier, how did this work? How do you send these images across the cable or across the air and the audio and, you know, get color and get stereo audio? And, you know, and I, so I, you know, tried to learn what I, 
could at the time and, um, you know, built some electronics and things like that, just in trying to learn. And I was just fascinated by that. And I think that's what changed me was, you know, seeing these things that seemed supernatural to me, right? How do you make this thing work to send this stuff, but, you know, from nowhere, you can't see it. And I was just always enamored by that and challenged to want to understand it better to see how these people created these things these ideas it was just amazing i love that answer and what what occurs to me listening to you answer that is i'm certain that there are people that look at technologies like fiber like dsl back in the day and thought have thought and ruminated on the same fact which is how the heck do we take all of this you know, all this data, all these bits, and send it from one point of the world to another one, all seemingly instantaneously. And uh, you were a part of that development. So that's pretty, pretty awesome how that all works, Eddie. Eddie Barker, um, it was a, a pleasure chatting with you today, uh, talking about some really important um, historical moments in the world of technology and things that I think we all benefit from and enjoy on a daily basis. So, Eddie, thank you for doing the important work and thank you for uh, talking to me about it today. I appreciate it. Jason, thanks so much for having me. It was a real privilege. Thank you for inviting me to Techsploder. All right. A huge thanks to our guest, Eddie Barker, also the folks at at and for helping set this chat up. What a cool look at a technology that I've used uh, a lot in my lifetime. Listen up, everybody. We could not do this podcast without your support. And right now, the most direct way uh, for you to support us is at our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Jason Howell. There, we offer ad-free shows, early access to videos, a Discord community, regular hangouts and Q&As with me and the extended Textbloater family and a whole lot more. We also offer the chance to be an executive producer of this show, just like this week's executive producers, Jeffrey Maraccini, John Cuny, Katie Lake, and our newest executive producer, Bill Rudder. Thank you all so much for supporting this independent podcast. Literally could not do it without you. Texploder podcast publishes every Friday on the Texploder YouTube channel. This week's episode was a pre-record, but when there is a live recording, you will find that event on the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at Texploder. I'll put up a, a thing there that you can follow it so that you're notified when it goes live. Don't forget to like, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you happen to be. It really helps us out a lot. And you can find everything you need to know about the show at Texploder.com. Thank you so much for watching and listening. I'm Jason Howell. We'll see you next week on another episode of the Texploder podcast. Bye, everybody. Bye.